Welcome to this month's webcast presented by OJM Group. Has the global rally in stocks run its course? A look into 2014 and beyond. I am Adam Braunschweidel, an investment manager here at OJM. And again, we'll be looking in, uh, taking a look at, the, at our expectations for the global markets in uh, 2014 and beyond. Now, of course, any good investment presentation wouldn't quite be complete without a, a couple pages of disclosures here. Um, it's important to note that we, we are an SEC registered advisor with the state of Ohio. We did want to offer up uh, some of our OJM materials and make them available free to all attendees today. Uh, as you can see, we do have a specific uh, niche for doctors specifically, but certainly as you can see on the bottom, there are a few um, books uh, specifically for affluent individuals and business owners as well. Topics today that we will discuss who is OJM Group? We'll take a look at uh, some of the firm's capabilities, uh, what we do. And we'll really dive into the purpose of the, the webcast, our, our wealth management's outlook for 2014, and some of the catalysts and, and potential hazards that we see possibly playing out throughout the year. So who is OJM Group? As, as I mentioned before, you know, we're, we're a comprehensive, multidisciplinary firm with professionals that cover a variety of practice areas. Uh, we have an in-house in -house CFPs, we have a CPA in-house, we have an attorney in-house, uh, we have a business valuation expert in-house. So, so certainly multiple uh, professionals that, that span various financial planning areas. Uh, as you can see, we do do investment management, uh, retirement planning, education and college planning, some tax advisory consulting services, uh, a little asset protection consulting planning as well, some pri private client services, as well as insurance and legal planning as well. On the RIA side, we, as I said before, we are an SEC registered advisor in the state of Ohio. We manage right around 250 million in assets, and we do have multiple professional designations, as I mentioned before with decades of experience. Uh, our, our approach is uh, an institutional style fee-based management, um, and we are independent and free of conflict, and, and we'll get into a little bit of that here at the bottom, but a, a, big, a big style of our, or a big, a big differentiator for, for our team here is we do include the use of alternative assets in, in our portfolios, and really, those are used to, to smooth out return streams and, and really lower the overall volatility of, 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 of the portfolios. And we do that, you know, in a customizable way. Certainly all individual portfolios are, are somewhat customizable. And we, we look at certain things as tax efficiency, uh, various exit strategies for some concentrated positions that we see come through for clients, um, some tax harvesting strategies as well. And then we do that by you know, using mutual funds, ETFs, and, and also the alternative investment strategies that we mentioned before. We do manage assets for clients in 30 states across the country. So, so we do have a somewhat countrywide base. And, and again, we do partner with some of the largest custodians in the world, including Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, and Credit Suisse. And really what that means is we don't take possession of assets here in-house. So let's kind of dive into the 2014 investment outlook. The, the investment team here really sees uh, our expectations are for average to slightly below historical average equity returns for, for 2014. Um, and, and some of the themes we, we see playing out for the year, uh, we do see continued improvement in the housing market. And we will, we will touch upon uh, these bullet points in greater detail throughout the, the presentation. Um, we see some increased consumer confidence in spending. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on uh, net worth across um, individual and families, how those have increased through the past couple of years. Uh, we think monetary policy remains accommodative in 2014, and we'll, we'll go into some of the details on uh, some of the recent Fed activities that have been going on. 
And also, we, we do think it's crucial, it's, it's important this year that investors' asset allocation discipline is, they remain focused and, and disciplined. Um, we do not want to chase returns, you know, or increase uh, investor risk tolerance simply to get those more equity-like returns, especially after 2013, uh, when the U.S. equity markets were up, were up north of 30%. So let's look at some of the catalysts for this year. Uh, housing, specifically, uh, the housing recovery ap appears sustainable. Um, and really what's a, a big driving factor of that is the continued low cost of borrowing. Uh, the 10-year right now as we, as, we, as we speak actually sits right around 2.7. Um, and, and as I touched upon on the last slide, the Fed has, has certainly uh, changed, their, changed their tapering stance. You know, they've reduced by 10 billion in their bond buying purchasing program uh, the last couple of months. So we went from 85 billion a month in purchases just a few months ago, um, and we're down to 65 billion a month now. And that's, that's spread across. They're actually purchasing 30 billion in mortgage-backed securities and 35 billion in treasury securities a month. So although that's come down a little bit, they continue to certainly remain accommodative. I think it's important to note here too, you know, the Fed, they really have, have maintained that they will not raise rates and, and certainly if they do, if rates do start to rise, it'll be slow and gradual, nothing, they don't want to shock the market. Uh, they've set their, their threshold for unemployment, they'd like to see at 6.5%, we're currently at 6.7% here in the U.S., um, so, so they have given some guidance there, although that does come up, come as somewhat of a caveat as, you know, they have they have altered that that threshold before in the past in uh, previous meetings throughout 2013. So really, moving forward, they have stated that although they may reach that 6.5 threshold, that does not necessarily mean you know that the switch will be turned off for their their buying program. And then we'll look at some psychological impact on cons on consumption. We touched upon uh, family household net worth increases over the last couple of years, and we'll see see what that has looked like. you can see below, you know, there, there has been a U.S. stock market and rebound in housing, uh, and that's really helped aid or boost the overall family's household net worth. Uh, as you can see on the graph below, uh, total household net worth actually rose $8 trillion in 2013 and $6 trillion in 2012, uh, so about $14 trillion over the last couple of years, which you know, that should aid to consumer spending, although some would argue that that's a little top-heavy. Certainly, we still think that that's a, a contributing factor to increase consumer spending over the next year or so. I also did like to point out that the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index was up 11% from a year earlier. And, and it appears that the percentage of homeowners who owe more on their homes uh, than they are worth actually fell to 13% from 22% a year ago. And, th and that also is a a helpful factor as we look into 2014. We do see household debt at uh, historically low levels, and really, again, this is back to the interest rate theme, uh, and that's uh, a main driver of that is the, the low interest rates uh, that the Fed has basically manipulated, you know, their, with their bond buying purchases. Um, we do see an improved debt and credit picture, which we, we again, think bodes well for consumer increased consumer spending. Um, it's, it, it appears, you know, households are deleveraging and uh, seem to be well along the path towards reaching more sustainable levels. And furthermore, we think credit conditions continue, continue again to improve and remain relatively loose throughout the year. Just taking a quick glance at uh, the jobless claims, uh, they have seemed to be decreasing ever since the their peak there in 2008 during the financial crisis, um, which obviously again somewhat of a caveat as you have you have certain people leaving the workforce and no longer looking for jobs certainly drop out of that number, but but it is it is nice to see that that that, that initial claims has been dropping. Um, over the last couple of years. Now let's look at, uh, we mentioned how, how critical investor discipline will be this year. And, and I kind of wanted to highlight, we'll, we'll touch upon a couple things here, um, but really highlight some of the, 
the global equity markets um, and their PEA rate, their forward PE ratios. Uh, as you can see, both the U.S. and European stock markets have somewhat gotten to normalized levels, or really near near high levels for the last six, seven years. Um, and the reason we mention this is because the emerging market space uh, has really has really underperformed, especially in 2013, with negative returns. Now, does that mean we we look to abandon the the emerging market equity space altogether? No, and then, and that's why it's important that investors keep that discipline, you know, their, their overall asset allocation, they keep a disciplined approach and they don't look to chase U.S. equity and European stock returns because, you know, we think really, especially in the emerging market space, that the negative performance were, were was really a largely an overreaction to shorter term factors and, and not justified by any long term fundamentals or valuations. It's, it's, it seems that the, the emerging market has somewhat of an idiocentric uh, problem, you know, you have certain countries such as Thailand, Ukraine, with some political issues. Um, Turkey, you know, certainly some issues with their central bank. Uh, they've been the government's been instructing the central bank, uh, basically guiding their monetary policy, and, and uh, our team here views that uh, may not make much sense. Uh, so you have some some of those issues on some of these countries across emerging markets, and then you have countries such as Venezuela, Argentina, some issues there as well. Um, but again, we do long-term continue to view emerging market stocks as likely to generate higher returns than the U.S. stocks across really most scenarios. Um, and really a contributor to that is the, the, the potential is a function more of attractive valuations, like I said, really after that huge disparity in performance in 2013, as well as what we expect to be stronger earnings growth over the next five-year time horizon. Um, now again, it does come what, it does need to be said that there is certainly more downside risk and volatility across the emerging market space, and, and we do take that into account in our overall portfolio construction. And just another point here, actually, as, as, we, as we get into the first quarter, and a lot of companies here in the U.S. and globally are reporting earnings, I think it's important to note that 69% that of companies have actually been beating earnings estimates and 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 60% have actually been beating revenue estimates. So actually right in line, if not a little higher than, than historic there. So continuing to aid the, the equity story for 2014. So let's look at some potential hazards for the year. Uh, we think wage growth will remain subpar. Uh, again, U.S. debt levels will remain very high. And we're interested to see here Internally, how the Fed will continue to unwind its unprecedented quantitative easing policies. Uh, they obviously have a, a balance sheet north of $4 trillion at this point, so how they continue to unwind that throughout the year is, is going to be something that we're watching. For wage growth, uh, wage and income growth in the United States, again, remain subpar, although both have been increasing slightly, you can see, since late 2012. Uh, we think that that weak income growth implies that consumer spending could be subdued even as we mentioned before consumers deleverage and, and that becomes less of a headwind um, and it, it's important to note that because with consumption accounting for roughly 70 percent of u.s gdp this does suggest continued sluggish economic growth and that's really absent a significant increase in consumer borrowing or reduced savings for example we look here, uh, overall U.S. debt levels remain very high, and uh, the projected growth in government debt and entitlement spending relative to GDP is, is still too high to be sustainable over the long term. Um, and really to resolve this without causing much of an economic con contraction is, is likely to be challenging even in a normal growth environment, which we certainly are, are not necessarily in at this point in time. Um, you can see the chart shows total for total household government, that includes federal, state, and local, and non-financial corporate debt as a percentage of GDP. Um, it, it is still right near the all-time uh, post-World War II high due to continued growth in the government and corporate debt, debt space. Um, and beyond the economics of deleveraging, the situation is made, made somewhat more challenging due to the, some political dysfunction we have here in this country. You know. Although it, it, it does come with that, that we were able to afford to compromise and progress a little bit on some of the longer-term debt and deficit situation, um, 
there, there, there seems to be some signs of, of light reflected in the recent bipartisan budget agreement. So, so that was somewhat hopeful. Um, certainly the, the low down from 2013 was the, the government shutdown fiasco. We certainly got over that without too much of an issue, but, but it seems that the public opinion of Congress is, is somewhat low here today, and there could be a potential for positive surprise in that regard. And, and unfortunately, the risks related to excessive global debt, subpar growth, and really unprecedented government policy have, that we have worried about since the aftermath of the uh, 2008 financial crisis really today remain largely unresolved. And just looking specifically here at the federal debt, so you can see the graph below illustrates the total public debt as a percent of gross domestic product. So you can see we're, we're certainly at an all-time high here. Uh, it actually just dropped below 100% here in the last year. Um, but it's important to know that you know we can't continue to take on as much debt as we have without you know resolving that. And, and I think, again, this, this graph really helps aid when you're looking at some of these other emerging market economies, certainly nowhere near the amount of debt that, that we have here in this country. Uh, a lot of the emerging market economies actually have ratios right around 50%, which is another reason that we do, we do continue to invest in this space, um, in the emerging market equity space, and, and again, not going to abandon that just because of the, the, the pressure, the downside selling pressure recently and the underperformance in 2013. Fed monetary policy is really far from normal, as we all know. Um, again, how, how the Fed unwinds its large balance sheet uh, will, will be integral for the year. Um, and, and although we, we did discuss it's, it's, it's begun, they've, they've decreased by 10 billion over the last two meetings here, so they've gone from 85 to 65 again. Um, how they continue to unwind that balance sheet will, will be will be very important to global equity markets. Um, and, and really, they've, they've continued to reiterate that they're, again, just because they reach their unemployment or inflation uh, mandates does not necessarily mean they're just going to pull the plug all altogether. Um, they certainly don't want to cause an economic or market shock. So certainly they have that in mind. Um, and, and we do think it's it's more than likely than not that the Fed will err on the side of tightening monetary policy too late raising rates too late rather than too early. Uh, and, and we think inflation could become an issue for financial markets, which would be really a negative for both stocks and bonds. Um, but as we discussed, it's really not an immediate concern at this time. Um, and really that's because, you know, given their policy pronouncements as well as their unpleasant experience this past summer with uh, the reaction to the taper talks, really put a, put a low probability on the Fed tightening too aggressively. Um, but certainly, it's, it's certainly policy error, errors in either direction are, are certainly possible. So we we remain cognizant of that, or cognizant of that fact. Certainly, watching how Fed leadership changes from Bernanke to Janet Yellen, um, we don't think that will lead to a significant change in policy, but certainly unknown at this time. Um, now let's look at a little bit, and I'm kind of going off the slides here, but. It, touch upon some of the other global economies, uh, the Eurozone, Japan, China, for example. Um, looking at Euro, Europe and the Eurozone specifically, the economy remains very weak. They have some structural imbalances between creditor and debtor countries that are still quite far from resolved. Uh, there remains a meaningful risk of deflation and a debt crisis uh, stemming from the, the weaker peripheral countries that we touched upon earlier. Uh, the banking system continues to be undercapitalized in need of a credible region-wide banking union backstop. And the, the, really, the recent efforts on that front are, are pretty far from sufficient. Uh, you can see in October of 2013, Eurozone inflation actually fell to 0.7%, which prompted the European Central Bank to make a surprise interest rate cut to, to what was a record low of 0.25%. And that was really amid rising fears that Europe could potentially fall into the trap that Japan has, has, has been experienced over the last two, three decades, uh, where they've been stuck in a stagnant and a deflationary environment. And uh, although it is important here to note that the European unemployment actually dropped to 7.1% recently, 
uh, with the, the European Central Bank's mandate, somewhat like the Fed is at 7%, although they did reiterate that much like the Fed, just because they reach that does not mean they'll, they'll you know, continue, start to rise rates too soon, raise rates too soon. Um, looking at Japan, you know, being the third world's largest economy, how how successful uh, Abenomics is, is is a wild card and, and will certainly have important global economic and market implications. Um, really, we're just recognizing here it's a, another manifestation of an unbalanced and weak global economy. And uh, the extremely aggressive and unconventional policies are being undertaken to turn things around in Japan. So, again, we monitor and we are monitoring that here internally. Um, then you have some risks in the financial system jumping ship here with, with China's debt and infrastructure spending. Um, there's certainly been recent PMI issues and slowdown in those o economies. Um, you can see it's encouraging to see that China's new leadership at least has acknowledged this and is addressing the cyclical and structural imbalances, although it's certainly no guarantee, as you know, that they can sex successfully manage those without somewhat of a major disruption. So that is the material for today. Um, I, I do like to kind of note here as well, just again, highlighting the theme, how critical it is that investors stay the course, you know, especially the long-term investors, that they stay disciplined and, and, and keep their portfolios diverse. Um, you know, we, we have talks here internally all the time of, you know, although we are obviously going to be in a rising interest rate environment over the next, you know, two, three, five years, it's important that you don't abandon the space altogether. You know, it's there for, you know, as we saw a couple, the first couple weeks here, last couple weeks, excuse me, in January, um, as, as U.S. equity markets and global equity markets have, have, have decreased, we've seen actually a decrease in rates, which the inverse relationship there between bond or fixed income has actually increased bond prices. Um, so certainly we we don't want to abandon the fixed income space. Although here we are we are underweight fixed income, um, and, and we are underweight fixed income in lieu of overweighting the alternative investment strategy space. Um, so certainly would be certainly willing to discuss some of those additional alternative strategies that we've that the team here has been kind of putting in place for the last three to six months. Uh, we would love to have a conversation about some of those opportunities that we're seeing out there in the market. Um, again, how, how OJM can help, uh, again, we have a multidisciplinary team of experts, as I discussed. We have CFPs here. We have a CPA, attorney, again, some business valuation experts as well um, that we think really help aid in the overall client experience. Uh, we have a more diverse background that allows us to, to not only view the, the relationship from an investment management style approach, but, but certainly more of a holistic approach when you include the, the entire team's uh, background and decades of experience. Um, and again, that really allows us to give a focused approach, you know, to tax planning, retirement and insurance planning, the asset protection issues. With that being said, that concludes the uh, webcast today. As uh, we touched upon early, you certainly feel free to contact the uh, OJM directly for for any of the free copies of the books you saw earlier on a slide, uh, the For Doctors Only, for example, or the Wealth Secrets of the Affluent, or any of the other books referenced early on the presentation. Feel free to also sign up for our free e e newsletter, um, and in it or all. Or also, we, we do make available today to all those listening uh, a free consultation uh, with one of our financial planners, if, if you'd so choose. Feel free to contact me directly. Uh, again, my name is Adam Braunscheidel. You see my email and telephone number below. So certainly feel free to reach out directly to me if you, you, know, if you just wanted to bounce an idea off or, or, or certainly get us some additional information as to what the team here internally is, is this thinking for 2014. Um, thanks for taking the time and look forward to talking to you.